Peter, very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for giving up your time today. I know that there are lots of people who dream about being their own boss and running their own um, sort of boutique coffee shop. So the chance to actually speak to you, who has clearly got a lot of experience and some, uh, some amazing awards that you've got as well, um, is a real privilege and a real opportunity for them. So I think to kind of give people some context and some background, how about you tell us a little bit about you? How did you get into being the person that you are and running the business that you run? And I've always worked in restaurants and hotels, uh, hospitality, catering, public bars, uh, cocktail bars, five-star hotels since I was about 17, started off washing dishes. It's always been something that I've wanted to do is work in hospitality. I just really, really enjoy the buzz of looking after people. Uh, yeah. I've been really, really busy and just getting hammered on service and the adrenaline rush that comes with that. The uh, instant gratification, I guess you could call it, that you look after somebody and provide them with something that they enjoy. Um, you know, they feed that back to you and you get that good, warm feeling. Um, and basically, I guess, you know, if you're reasonably good at something, you get a self-satisfaction out of that too, don't you? You find something good at and you enjoy it. So that's good. Um, I, I am originally from Melbourne and I came to London in 1995. Uh, stayed for three years, went back to Melbourne. And I started teaching and training hospitality. So I was working in the colleges and the high schools, etc. Uh, again, that was hugely rewarding too. But then, uh, very lucky, I got married, and my wife has an EU passport. And then we came back to London in 2005. Uh, I worked at Lord's Cricket Ground in the catering department, um, and I was responsible for all the staff working there. So I was like the staffing and recruitment manager. But in that time, um, in London, there was maybe two or three sort of specialty boutique coffee shops. There wasn't many places around, very many Australian places. And I thought there was an opportunity to open an Australian style coffee place in London, but that has hospitality at its core, at its you know, core belief. Um, and you know, hospitality is basically looking after people. And we do that by providing really good service, making delicious coffee and providing really good food within the con context or the constraints that we have. We're not a restaurant, we don't cook food to order. We're a pretty, we have two shops now, they're both small shops. Um, but within the context and the constraints that we have, we want to be basically the best that we are at that. Yeah. And tell me a bit, because obviously your, your business has been recognised, it's, it's a very successful business. Tell me a bit about some of the recognition or some of the awards that you've received. Oh, okay. So I did, I did, I, it was probably, you know, there would have been... In my business plan, I had three paths, potential paths that we would follow in writing the business plan. The first one was path A, and we were successful in media, notice, and awards, et cetera. And the second path was, okay, we're not doing so well, we have to sort of think about, and the third potential path was failure, okay? Mm -hmm. But um, it was always just about trying to focus on, when we first opened, it was being the best coffee shop in our area because yeah. that's where most of your customers are going to come from. And we wanted to be at least the best coffee shop in our immediate area. If we could do that, we should be okay. Uh, that was in August 2009. In November 2010, through a group called Allegra, who run the European Coffee Festival, sorry, the UK Coffee Festival, the Amsterdam Coffee Festival, they do what's called the European Coffee Symposium, and they get uh, an awards ceremony where people from the industry vote, and we were voted best independent coffee shop in Europe. Amazing. And that was November 2010. So like, okay, well, that's a very nice compliment. So from then on, that's always been our goal. And I say that to all the, the, the interviewees this morning. I say that, I tell that story because we always want to be regarded as one of the best coffee shops in the UK because we've always done that. And if we are, then we're going to be regarded as one of the best in the area too. So that's still achieving that goal as well. Um, We've got numerous uh, certificates from TripAdvisor, which is always nice, the you know, Certificates of Excellence. Um, uh, in 2011, yeah, 2011, I've got them to see how I'm on the desk. <laughs> so, uh, so I was awarded um, the Cafe Society Award, which is like the top award through the Cafe Society for influence on the industry, which I was very, very surprised at. But, uh, you know, two years after opening, they award me that. 
The year after that, they gave the same award to the guy who started Cafe Nero. Oh my God, that's amazing. No, 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 I was like, okay, that's uh, pretty amazing. Um, I was very really like, we were given this award in 2014. Brilliant. This flat white. And uh, one of the big things that was really fantastic for me, it's just funny, I've got the lawyer on my desk. <laughs> this one, which is uh, an Master invitation. Master of the household, cool. Yeah, do you know who that's from? Mm, the Queen? Yeah, exactly. Unbelievable. Yeah, so she went to Australia um, in 2011. And every time she goes to Australia, before she goes, she has the cocktail party at the palace and they invite lots of Australians to, to come along. So I was one of those people who was invited along, basically because I'm an Australian who has a coffee shop in London. Um, but uh, yeah, there was lots of famous Australian people there uh, and lots of Australian business people there. And that was, it's not an award necessarily, but it's it's a reward for doing what we do. Yeah, it's really yeah. nice. Mm. Amazing. So, but the, the biggest reward that you get, I think, these little things are really nice. They're like, they're obviously trophies that you have. The biggest reward that you get is the people who work for you and seeing them come through and be successful. Yeah. And either work with you and be successful or even leave you and go on and be even more successful. And that's the really rewarding thing about having, in my mind, a business is working yeah. with those people and seeing them do that. Mm. I think it's I think it's wonderful, and I th I think that kind of that nature of yours that wants to kind of give and share um, is clearly one of the things that we picked up on when you know we were trying to find who who are the people that we can have on our website as you know experts at their business that are clearly clearly brilliant at what they do, but also quite passionate and want to help other people. So um, yeah, just delighted delighted to still be talking to you today. That's my pleasure. Thank you. Um, so I think kind of getting down to things in terms of, you know, you and your day job and what it's like doing what you do, there's obviously, you know, you've already touched on a number of the things that are clearly very rewarding <laughs> for you. Um, but just, I guess, for the benefit of other people who might be watching or might be listening at some point, what would you say are the best and the worst things about running your own coffee shop business? Well, I just, I guess I just touched on that, is working yeah. with the people who, uh, who work hard. You know, it's just so rewarding and so nice to see someone come in and just really work hard and re enjoy what they do um, and push themselves because they want to be successful. You know, they, they, they have that belief within themselves. If I come, you know, a lot of them come from other countries, obviously, and they've come yes. here and they want to get better. Um, you know, a prime example, one boy came from Greece and he, you know, he used to work in, he, he told me, I work hard in Greece. I work two jobs. I work all the time. I work really hard. But he couldn't tell me that in English. You know, he'd hardly speak a word of English, but he impressed me so much with his interview and then we gave him the job. And now he's off, his English is amazing. He's worked so, so hard. He just, he works, he makes money, he works, he makes money and he's getting more and more successful. So, you know, just little things like that. Um, yeah. A fellow who worked for me, he's an English boy and he's from Cheshire, Cheshire. And he came down to London, he was interested in coffee. He worked at a coffee, couple of coffee places first, then he came to me as a barista. He was 21 years old, I think, 22. Um, soon became our lead barista, it was back in 2012. He then went off and opened his own coffee cart business, uh, doing coffee uh, in basically rave parties in fields. Okay. He then started doing coffee events for places like Nike, Google, London Fashion Week, all those places, uh, traveling across the world, doing coffee events there. And now he's opened his own dairy and he's doing sort of Brewster specialty milk. And he's now supplying some of the best restaurants and best coffee shops across the UK, or across London mainly, uh, in milk. And he, you know, so that's the sort of thing that's really rewarding. Yeah. The hard part and one of the, the most distressing parts, I guess, is when people just don't work out. Yeah. And as much as what you do, you try, them, you try to teach them, you try to train them you try to push them, you try to encourage them, and these things don't quite work. And you have to sit down with someone at the end of the day and say, this is just not working for us. Um, and we have to come to an agreement that, or we have to, there's a serious conversation we need to have here. Uh, yeah. That's a bit unfortunate. Um, yeah. I don't know about other business owners, but sleeping is sometimes hard. <laughs> oh, shame. <laughs> what kind of hours yeah. do you work? 
Uh, I'm very, very lucky. I have, I'm, I seriously have a very good balanced lifestyle. I think if I was, was not married and didn't have children, I'd by myself, I would work probably a lot more. Yeah. Um, but I try to have a very balanced lifestyle. But, you know, these, these times when you wake up at two o'clock in the morning and you're awake for two or three hours and then, you know, stuff going through your head and, you know, yeah. that's, not, that's not much fun. That's pretty hard. Um, but for the most part, I guess, you know, it's, it's a, a reasonably good life. Yeah. Mm. yeah, it's enjoyable. As long as you can get that balance, you need to have, you've got to have structures in place. You can have managers who believe in what they're doing and know what they're doing. You know, you've got to <clears throat> set yourself up for mm -hmm. business basically is able to run itself. If you yeah. don't do that, you're going to be in huge, huge trouble. Yeah, I remember my, you know, my brother used to run a hotel. And it's a similar deal. Mm -hmm. Being your own boss can be a complete nightmare because you're the person who gets the phone call at three in the morning, you know, from a customer who wants to have a, their pillow changed, you know, or when yeah. you're on holiday and the boiler breaks, you're not on holiday. You know, you've got to, yeah. that's it. You've got to get back to the hotel, try and sort things out. So, yeah, it's, it, that I can, I can relate to that being the hard side of things and then oh, yes. waking up. But, but yeah. that's, you're opening a business, you need to accept that that's part of that. Of having to do that, you know, yes. you want to have a job and you have a job and do that, but um, you know, these are the things that you're going to be dealing with as well, um, yeah. and you have to learn to deal with that. Um, yeah. but for the most part, you know, there's a fantastic book called The E Myth Revisited. Mm. Uh, you, you, I highly recommend that you read if you haven't to read that book, it's basically about creating a business that's a product because that's yeah. what it is. Uh, whether it's a, a cup of coffee or a piece of cake, whatever, that's a product, but your business is a product as well. And you're trying to make your product as valuable as possible. So one day someone will hopefully come and buy it. But in doing that, you're creating systems and processes and procedures in place that will then also make your life better and easier too. Yeah. The more you do that, the more structure you have, the, the, the better it's going to be for you. Mm. You're already starting to touch on it, you know, in terms of thinking about, you know, you've talked about, the need to have structure and to employ, you know, the employment of people, but also the management of people. So you're starting to talk about the main skills that you use to do your job well. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you think in order to do what you do, what are the sorts of skills that someone needs to bring with them to be able to be successful in this sort of career? The main skills. A simple one is work hard and be nice to people. Yeah. That's a simple one. But overall, you really, I think you really need to have a good uh, breadth of skills in all areas. Yeah. Um, because, you know, so, I mean, I'm not a barista, okay? Yeah. So I, I'm not there making coffee, five or six hundred coffees a day. Uh, when we first opened, I can, I can, and I can still steam milk and I can still do a little bit of etc. So if required, I can jump on and make coffee. Yeah. If required, I can jump in the kitchen and make the food for the kitchen. And again, when we about a year after opening, I spent seven weeks in the kitchen uh, while my chef was in Australia getting a sponsorship. Long story, but you know, I had to come and work in the kitchen and do that. Obviously, I can do a bit of service. Um, you need to understand your figures. Not to, it's up to you. You can take that as far as you want. But understanding your numbers and what's happening is absolutely key. You can't yeah. just ignore that. Uh, the more you understand about it, the better. Um, but you can also get to a point, okay, I'm happy with that. I understand it. I'm comfortable with that. But you need to understand what your P&L means, what your GP means, what your wage cost is, what your rental costs are, the other costs that come into it, et cetera, as well, how VAT works, which is just an awful thing, um, et cetera. It, it's probably helpful, and you probably learn a lot as you, as you go along how to fix things. Yeah. So fixing things. I've got my own... So I, I, I have, uh, if you ask my brother, I'm not very good at doing this sort of stuff, but um, you know, I've got a drill and I can use screwdrivers and I can fix things. So I can take apart grinders, I can fix some coffee machines, I know a bit about that. Um, I know how to unblock a sewer. Nice. Right, I can tell you. It's I'm surprised cool. that didn't come into the real, like the worst thing <laughs> that your uh, job can entail. Yeah, that can be pretty bad. I've had some pretty bad experience. But, you know, you, you, if you own a coffee shop, there's every possibility that your sewer will block up. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And you Good. need to get it to fix it. And it's really expensive to get it fixed. And okay. the more you know, the more you can do yourself, the better. So um, yeah. you know, how electricity works, where to turn your water off if the water main 
first. There's so many different things you're trying to do yourself to save yourself some money. You know, yeah. Yeah. I can keep going. How to fix a toilet. Oh my God. Okay. So, I mean, this is all really helpful because these will be things that I think if someone's sitting in a coffee shop enjoying the product and they're fantasizing about doing this themselves, I'm sure that these are some of the things that they're probably not thinking about. Oh, um, no, no, no. That's, how, that's how, does that, how does that kind of shape itself over the course of a week? I mean, clearly you're probably not fixing sewers for 90% no. of a week, but what, you know, if you were to kind of describe your typical week, what would, what would the kind of the proportions of the different work that you do, how would that play out? A lot, it's sort of funny if you ask me what do I do I don't really know I have massive lists of things to do I get lots of emails so you try and respond to yeah. those um, yeah. you know you try and delegate some of the work sometimes to your managers to do that um, it depends on the on the week so there's times when I'll be working on service and I might be doing one or two or three shifts a week on service because we, you know there might be staff away and we don't have enough staff so you, you know you're actually on service um, yeah. But then you, know, you need to respond to emails, people saying, oh, we want to sell you this product and it's going to be amazing in your store. No, thank you. Um, sometimes you get so many of those, it's like delete straight away. Um, you know, you advertising for people, recruiting for people, uh, writing, this should be done in early days, writing job descriptions, uh, updating recipes that you have inside, um, operations manuals, training manuals. So, you know, we're really trying to develop our uh, structured training and learning and development at the moment. Yeah. So, uh, you know, writing manuals on how we do service, how we do coffee, um, yeah. make you know, those, it's, it seems quite continuous and it's quite a lot. It's hard to describe what you do every day though. Yeah. Yeah. Because, so, and, I, and I guess, I mean, it, it's a huge amount of variety of what you're doing. And I guess oh, that's also part of some of the appeal. Yeah. Uh, payroll. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Doing payroll and you know doing rostering. So again, our managers yeah. uh, will organise the rosters for the week. You know, it can, it can take them an hour or two to you know, write a roster out. Yeah. Um, invoices. If you, you again, my managers will do that. I, I they basically get you know so many invoices every week. You need to work out what invoices uh, have come in, what they're for, uh, how much you spend per week. Um, yeah. You should be looking at. I look at my bank statements every week. And I'm checking yeah. where my bank is on forecasting out, you know, 12 months in advance, how much, what cash is coming in, what cash is uh, going out. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can so. see it's a very involved, it's a very involved role doing a whole range of different things. Yes. Um, for anyone who is thinking of doing this, are there any kind of like main barriers that might prevent someone coming in? Is there a sort of an absolute basic minimum qualification they need or, or can it really be open to anybody? It's yes and no, because opening a coffee shop is reasonably or can be seen as reasonably easy to do. <coughs> but what you're also doing, though, if you say have no experience whatsoever, is you're going into competition with people who have potentially lots of experience. Yeah. And so therefore, you're sort of putting yourself on the back foot already. So, you know, you just don't have that experience. It's like, I, you know, I have people come to me and they say, I want to open a coffee shop. Do you have experience? No. You ever worked in hospitality? When I was 18 in a pub, okay? So, so that's okay, that's fine. But you don't have hospitality working in that sort of environment experience. And that's even just going down to actually opening the place, you know, prior to opening and knowing all the things you need to actually open and operate that place. And you yeah. haven't done that before, you're not really gonna know that sort of stuff. So yeah. it's a real challenge for you. Yeah. So there's no reason, you know, you can certainly do it, but you're gonna have a real challenge. And there's sort of maybe the analogy that I use is I would love to play professional golf, okay? I love golf, it's great. I don't play very often, but I'd like to play. But do you think I can go out now and be a professional golfer? No. Yeah. So you know, I wouldn't, you wouldn't survive out there. You're going to have to, I'd have to go out and work so, 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 so hard to try and get up to that sort of level to be yeah. that. Um, yeah. so, but I could possibly do that. I could go out and play golf every day, and, yeah, but it's going to be really hard work. Yeah. Um, it's hard enough work as it is if I've got 30 years experience in hospitality. It's still pretty hard work. 
Yeah, mm. no, I can appreciate that. And yeah, I think yeah. you're right. I mean, people, I think, always underestimate the amount of competition that's out there. And even though, as you say, there may not necessarily be a barrier to entry in the sense that, you know, it, you can't go off and become a doctor without doing the, you know, the medical training. There isn't a barrier to entry in this respect that's, no. that's like that. But by the same token, the barrier to entry is all of the people around you who know exactly what they're doing and they've been doing it for, you know, tens of years. So, yeah, yeah. I'm with you. You're setting yourself up with more of a challenge. That's okay. You want to take that on. But you just got to make sure you understand that. Okay, I have no yeah. experience whatsoever, but, you know, it's going to be reasonably hard work. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think if someone was, you know, just, I guess, despite that, so knowing this challenge and knowing what might be ahead of them, if someone was to say, right, well, screw it, I, I really just want to do it anyway. I want to give it a go. Um, yeah. What what might be, you know, if someone was opening up a new coffee shop, let's assume it's a successful one. What might they, what might be a realistic earning income for someone if they were just starting out? Or in fact, is that a totally unrealistic question? Maybe the question is, what should they expect to spend in the first year? It's a hard question to answer, mainly because it very much depends on obviously the area that you're in and how yes. much revenue you're making, etc. Okay, then. But basically, what you might be looking at, and it's sort of the, it then relates on to whether to what else you're selling in the shop. Yeah. So when you say a coffee shop, okay, so you're obviously selling coffee, but what else are you selling to help supplement your income? Yeah. So coffee. Now, coffee in London, three pounds for a latte. Okay, yeah. so you take off VAT you're down to around two pound sixty, or two pound forty actually, so that you're actually you know making out of that one coffee. Um, in other, and that's you know specialty coffee in other parts of the UK. It's, it may be cheaper, two pound fifty. I'm not even sure. <clears throat> you're still going to take off VAT. Yeah. You're going to take off. You know, you're going to. You need that. It's like uh, the spend per person or spend or spend per purchase. So then you you got your food. You try to increase the amount that people spend when they come in. Yeah. But if you're just selling a bit of cake and sandwiches, uh, you know, some breakfast stuff, you know, not big meals, which is obviously a higher spend, you might end up looking at around five to six pounds per person per spend. Yeah. Yeah. At, at a push. Okay, then. So then how many people are going to come through the door every day? Yeah. Yeah, and then I guess that depends a bit on your marketing yeah. as well and the location. Come on, yeah. your marketing, your footfall, your location, your branding, the way your shop looks. Is it attractive for people yes. to come into? Is it yes. easier for people to come into? What sort of seating's involved? How fast mm. are you at serving? If you've got a 10 hour day, so from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., that's 600 minutes. How many people can you serve in 600 minutes? Yeah. The yeah. answer is what? Yeah. What's the answer? Um, Sixty? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> so you can say how you you got one person a minute, six hundred minutes. Okay, so push it out to the maximum. There's six hundred minutes in a day. How many people can you serve in a minute? Maybe one. If you're lucky. So that's a maximum of six hundred people. So if you if you're getting five pounds a head, you might be lucky to get three thousand pounds in a day. That's really really a very very good operation. Yeah. Okay. But you're not going to get six hundred people one person every minute. So no, that's, yeah. your, that's pretty that's a really big operation that is um so you might look at 200 people a day 300 people a day yeah, yeah. what are you looking at to try and get your revenue in five pounds a head so you might make 1500 pounds in a day yeah mm. no, really helpful really helpful <laughs> really, and, and, you know, uh, your your main costs your main cost is going to be wages yes probably. Okay, then, especially if you're trying to pay yourself, you're probably looking around 35 to 40% of your net revenue going on wages. So that's straight up 40%. When you take it to a maximum, 40% gone. Mm -hmm. uh, in your early days, you might be looking at 50% of your wages, of your net revenue goes on wages because you're not making enough money. Yeah, yeah. So then, how much is your rent? Yes. Now you know that straight away. So is it 20% of your net revenue or 10% of your net revenue or 5%? If it's 20% and 40% is on wages, that's 60% of your revenue is gone already. And then what's your food cost and your cost of goods sold? In those yes. places, it's around 30%. So if you've got 40% wage cost and 20% rent cost, that's 60. And then 30% food cost, that's 90. 
the 90% of that revenue is gone. Yeah. And there's 10% left. Tough, my God. And then no you've got wonder. electricity, yeah. water, banking, accounting. And they're 1% each, that's 4%. God, why would anyone do it? <laughs> very, so that's very... the sort of thing you want to look at. You want to see, look at all your costs and work out. These are potential, you know, if I can make, if I can get everyone to spend five pounds per visit and I get 300 people a day, that's, that's why we yes. get potential revenue. Yeah, mm. yeah. No, really helpful. And I think when, um, you know, obviously when, when we approached you, one of the things that we wanted to try and do is, you know, help, help people who are thinking about doing this understand a little <laughs> bit more about the reality of the world. Um, you actually had someone quite recently um, come and spend the day with you. Just from your perspective, what is it like being, I guess, an expert advising other people on starting up their own businesses? Um, in some ways, the lady that I met, I thought was amazing. And she had, was so, so, so prepared for the meeting. Yeah. Uh, she had lots and lots of thinking and lots and lots of organization and lots of uh, prior writing. Uh, there were some things that she hadn't thought of or hadn't realized. Uh, for example, she was looking at an A3 shop, which is basically like a restaurant. And so the rent and the potential key money to actually buy the lease is really, really high that lots of coffee shops can operate in A1 licensed shops, which is like, you know, much cheaper. Um, so she was really impressive. And uh, I was very, very happy to talk with her and work with her and you know, have a good conversation with her. Uh, I had a guy come to me once and he said, oh, I've got 20,000 pounds. I, I think I want to open a coffee shop in London, in, in Leighton. Uh, I think I'm either going to renovate my house or open a coffee shop. Why do you want to open a coffee shop? Well, because there's none in the area. I think we need one. Yeah, okay. I just can't seem to make a profit, though. I'm, I've tried, done my figures. can't make a profit. I'm like, okay, show me your business plan. And he basically got a piece of paper like that. Yeah. Said, well, this is what I've tried to work out. It doesn't seem to work. I'm like, he's sort of a friend of a friend. And I was this close to telling him, like, swear word and saying, just get out. You, you are offensive to me because you think this is a coffee shop. Okay, that's not a coffee shop. And then I showed you my business plan and my planning and all the thought and process that went into that. Okay, so it can be really rewarding when I met that uh, young lady, but yeah. it can also be in, in that I've been offensive. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, I was, I was actually chatting to a woman this morning who's an illustrator about getting her onto the site as an expert. And she yeah. said it's, it is actually quite offensive, the number of people who contact her. Um, saying things like, share with me details of your suppliers, how much you pay for them, I want to develop my business plan. And she's like, this has taken me years to build up. I have no yeah. idea who you are. Yeah. And, and, and actually some of the anger that they will express to her if she doesn't get back to them. Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I think... I think there's a, I think I want to try and change people's mindset around the fact that, you know, if you want to do something new, I think that's fine. And I think it's great. And I will certainly help them put in touch, you know, put them in touch with people who are absolutely brilliant. But I do think that people need to recognize the opportunity cost and indeed the value of people's time um, in terms of people yeah. like you being able to spend time with them. Because the, the kind of advice that you can give people, I think, can really help make or break the business that they're going to then go on to eventually run. The last thing to ask you then, it was just, you know, before you and I got on the call, you were saying about your hiring yourself. Do you want to just share with anyone again who might be watching what it is that you're hiring for? Uh, yes, certainly. We're, so we're looking for uh, people to work on the service position. So you basically you have chefs, you have baristas, you have service, and you have managers as well. You know, the service yeah. to me, to me, every position is, of, is pretty much of equal importance. Um, a barista is just as important as a chef, and a chef is just as important as a service person. Everyone's reasonably equal. Um, but a, a person on service is that person who's, you know, the first thing the customer comes to the door, they're the first person they see. The jury, the first person, the last person they uh, see when they leave. You know, it's all about first impressions, last impressions. Yeah. Um, you know, you're looking for someone, and there's a really, another really good book by an American guy called Danny Meyer. He runs some amazing restaurants uh, in London, uh, sorry, in uh, New York. And he uh, also set up a, a burger company called Shake Shack. Oh, yeah. The super legend of the hospitality scene. 
in his book, what he says, what he looks for in people is 51% hospitality and 49% skill level. So you're looking for someone when you're employing someone that they basically have it within them that they want to care about people and look after people because you yeah. it's quite easy to teach them the skills. Here is how you set up a table. Here is how you, you know, but it's really hard to teach someone or have someone. This is how you look after people. They need to have that within them in the first place. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. You're right. It reminds me of pret manger They had a famous phrase or something that said, we hire happy people who can make sandwiches instead of hiring people who right. can make sandwiches and trying to train them to be happy. Yeah. So, yeah. Similar yeah. concept. Very similar. I'd much rather hire a happy barista than a grumpy barista. <laughs> yeah. Who wouldn't? <laughs> in my coffee and this person just looks so miserable like why are we even here this, yeah you know, and i'm quite happy to say that to a staff yeah. member just don't be here go away do something else yeah you know? yeah I agree. Uh, being on the rece receiving end as a customer if, you, if you're with someone who's bright and cheerful it does genuinely it can make your day it's brilliant yeah well that's yeah. our premise that's our, our base premise is that people will feel better when they leave than they did when they arrived. Yeah. It's it's how they feel. As long as they feel better when they leave than they did when they arrived, then we've done our job. Brilliant. And, you know, I think, well, at the end of this phone call, I think hopefully everyone else watching this will now make their way down to caffeine and go and spend, let's just try, not just five pounds, let's try and get a much of 10 pounds ahead. They'll leave better off than when they started. Well, if, they, if anybody does come down, they're more than welcome to ask for me and say hello. Yeah, you know, on the van. We always peer around. Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I'd love to, you know, I'll give them a quick tour of the premises and show them around. I'm more than happy to do that. Yeah, uh, you're amazing. Thank you, Peter. It's okay. Cool. All right. Well, we'll call it a day. I know you've got a very busy, a busy business that you need to get back to running. So thank you so much for your time. It's really okay. appreciated. It. And um, I'll be in touch again soon. Okay. Thank you. Right. Nice to meet you. Take care, Peter. Bye. Bye. -bye.